Hi guys and welcome to Chapter 5, Topic 1. In Chapter 5 we're going to talk all about DNA and chromosomes and Topic 1 is going to focus just on DNA. So what we're going to talk about in this topic, we're going to focus on the history of DNA, the genome, and the DNA structure. And it's going to be in two parts, so we'll do the chromosomes in the second part. Here are the topic objectives. As always, these are what I expect you to have mastered for the exam. Most of this topic will probably be pretty review for you, I hope. But if there's something that's sticking out, please let me know and I will make sure that we get it covered in class. So let's start by talking about what is DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and it's responsible for the inheritance of genetic information. This is the blueprint for everything that we are. It's the reason why you have the hair color you have. It's the reason why your eyes are the color you have. It's the reason why you sunburn like you may or don't or tan. Um, and that's all stored there and every cell in our bodies have your entire genome in there. That's why we can take a cheek sample and be able to sequence an entire gene, uh, your entire genome from it. It's just all in about how they're activated and we're going to get to that in a little bit later in this unit but right now um, it's important to be aware that every cell in your body has the entire genome. And this code of your DNA codes for the proteins that are going to be made as well as other things but mostly for the proteins. And we talked about this with sickle cell how there's a modification within the uh, base pairs and how that can change the way the proteins are built and that's what's really important. But beyond protein coding there's also a lot of regulation that goes into the DNA code. It tells us when and where and how much proteins we should be making and how things should be activating and this is what leads to cellular differentiation and as I said we'll talk about cell differentiation later in this, in this unit. So before we go too far, let's talk a little bit about the history of DNA. And you have hopefully heard about these three men that you see pictured here um, in your previous classes. But the first to really document inheritance patterns is Gregor Mendel. You know, we knew for a while that things were seemed to be similar, that people looked like their parents or their siblings looked similar. And Gregor Mendel, Mendel was the first to really work out how inheritance patterns um, work, at least the most basic ones. But he didn't know that DNA was what passed it on. In fact, he didn't have any sense of what was passing it on. He just knew that from, there was something being passed from parent to offspring. And it wasn't really until Watson and Crick um, developed the, or elucidated the structure of DNA in the double helix with Rosalind Franklin's help that really helped start driving forward the process of replication, transcription, and translation. And by understanding those methods, we were able to finally understand that, yeah, it is DNA that's, that is the inheritance molecule and not protein. In a long time, people thought it was proteins because there's 20 amino acids, there's 20 building blocks, so it'd be easier for to make up all of these different codes with that rather than the four nucleic, um, nucleotides. And so that's what everyone thought, but and once we had this structure, we really started to understand that, no, it is DNA that passes that on. And as you can see, we're still working on doing um, DNA analysis and their sequencing um, and even their structural analysis. I and mean, it wasn't until 2012 that we got the first actual picture of DNA taken. So it's really an incredible journey we've been on about DNA and there's still a lot more we have to understand. And the more we understand, the more we'll be able to help treat or at least understand the basics of a lot of diseases that people get. So I've said this word a couple times already, but let's talk about what the genome is. The genome is the entire genetic code of an organism. I have a genome, you have a genome, my dogs have a genome, everybody has their own genome and they're all slightly different. That's what makes us slightly different. And this genome is contained in every somatic cell of your body, which what does that mean? That means it's contained in every cell of your body except for your either your eggs or your sperm. Those are your um, gonads. and um, well, they're your gametes, but they're made in the gonads. And the somatic cells are what contains your entire genome because eggs and sperm have half as much. The first genome was sequenced in 2001, but we're still working out a lot of the genome information because we've sequenced some um, human genomes, but we haven't sequenced everybody's, and we probably never will, but we don't understand the variations. You can't just have this one sequence um, and work in a vacuum. It's all in about the variation that matters, and that's why there's such a, uh, a push to get more sequences done. But we learned through this process that the genome is approximately 25,000 genes long for humans, which was surprisingly small. Everybody thought it was going to be a lot longer. And we're going to talk about junk DNA and all that and how that plays a role in it later. Um, 
in the semester, but it, everyone really expected our genome to be significantly larger than it was. Something else we also learned is that most genes average about 20, 27,000 nucleotide pairs long, and there's some that are short, there are some that are long, but that's the average length, and that was pretty interesting. So let's talk about what makes up DNA. So the monomer of DNA is nucleotides. So the most basic building block of DNA is a nucleotide, which contains the phosphate, the sugar, and one of four nitrogenous bases. Now you may have heard the term nucleoside used before, and the nucleoside is the sugar in the base lacking the phosphate. So that's important to understand. Um, we really only care about nucleotides here, so focus on that, but just so that you're aware as to what that, um, that definition difference is. And so the four bases, we have two different groups of bases. We have pyrimidines and we have purines. And the pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine, and the purines are adenine and guanine. And they will always pair one pyrimidine to one purine, and we'll look at that on the next slide. So how are components arranged? There, as you can see here, we have our sugar phosphate backbone, which um, remember the sugar in DNA is deoxyribose, where the sugar in um, RNA is ribose, and that's really one of the main differences that separate the two. Those sugars and phosphates in that backbone of the nucleotide create the backbone of the DNA. And as you can see here, we have it. Um, the DNA runs anti-parallel to each other. What does that mean? That means that one side of the DNA is running in one direction and one side's running the other. So if we have, you know, our hands like this, the sequences are running like this, where you know they're running in opposite directions. And the reason why we see five prime and three prime, these are labeling for directions. I wouldn't worry too much about them, but do understand that that is the main. Um, the main directionality, and it's important to understand what we're talking about when we talk about three prime and five prime. And the three prime is where the hydroxyl group is left out at the very end, and that's the notch. And then we have the ball on the other side, which is the five prime end, where the phosphate group is sticking out. So it's important to understand how that works. And as you can see, we have the backbone, and then in between is the pyrimidine purine. Uh, binding and they bind through hydrogen bonding and you can see how that works and that is an energetically favorable favorable reaction and adenine will always bind with thymine and guanine will always bind with cytosine because it's thermo thermodynamically favorable and so it's not an effort to force that into something else. So then we have the double helix. So we've got the ladder, which is the backbone, sugar, phosphates on the on the outside, and then the pyrimidines, purines on the inside. And this is going to twist. Now the DNA is about two nanometers across, and when it starts to form this twist, there's actually two sizes of grooves that happen: the minor groove and the major groove. And this just is through the energetically favorable state of this. And double helixes and helices in general are a very favorable structure and that's why we see them so often in biology is it's very common for things to form this. Now it's important to note that it's about 0.34 nanometers between the different nucleotides and that the nucleotides are held together by phosphodiester bonds. So make sure you understand what that bond is that's holding the backbone together um, and then the hydrogen bonds are between the two. So we talked about this a little bit. How do we measure DNA in size? So we measure DNA in base pairs. So we want to know how many base pairs there are on each um, within that sequence. And as you can see here on this gel, and you guys have run these before in class, is that this is how DNA length works. The smaller the DNA length, the faster it will run on the gel, so the lower it will be. So as you can see here, we have in lane 6 a much smaller base pair length of DNA compared to lanes 1 through 5. And lanes 1 through 5 look like they're approximately 300, maybe 280 base pairs long, which means that there are 280 sets of um, bases in there. Another important item to note about DNA, and we've mentioned this before, but it's always bears repeating, is that while we talk about genomic DNA, we're talking about the uh, DNA that's found within the nucleus. But that's not the only site for DNA in the cell. There's mitochondrial and there's also chloroplast DNA. And it's important to note that because it's you don't want to be um, as broad in your statements as that would encompass that. So that's why we'll, you'll hear people talk about genomic DNA. Uh, the DNA that's found in mitochondria and chloroplasts are really important because it helps us determine molecular clocks, and that's how we can compare the evolution of different organisms. 
but it for our class we're going to mostly focus on genomic DNA and especially this unit we're going to focus almost entirely on genomic DNA. So I've said it once already, but DNA is the molecule of inheritance. What does this mean? How does this actually happen? It's the sequence. It's all about the ACTG. In that, in whatever order it happens in, that is the sequence that is going to create the function that we've seen in the cells. And remember, A will bond with T, C will bond with G. Any mistake in the sequence can have either no observable difference or it can have a huge large physiological change to the point where it can cause fat uh, fatalities or be incompatible with life as genetic counselors say. Now it's not just in the sequence of the proteins. We think about that a lot because we talk about sickle cell and how a single mutation can cause sickle cell disease. But if there's a mutation in a regulation part of the DNA, that can cause problems as well. That's how we can see cancers arise when there's a mutation within, that, within the regulation part. And we'll see that these sequences are passed on from parent to offspring in a semi-conserved manner in the fact that um, half of your DNA will go to your gametes and half will go to your partner's gametes and those come together to form um, the offspring, your zygotes, and that's, uh, or the zygote. And so that is how it's conserved through generations. So make sure you understand that. We're going to talk a lot about mutations later, but understand how this DNA is inherited. One last thing before we finish up this topic is I want to address one assay that's used and we had to do the human genome sequencing before we could do this because we needed to know what the sequence was. But what we do is a microarray and this allows us to see how the DNA of an experimental sample compares to a control sample. So we take this plate with all these wells and that's what these circles are you can see on here and we coat them with specific gene sequences that we're looking for or um, that we're trying to see if it's even present. We'll coat that in there and then we will put into there DNA that's either been dyed red or green depending on the control sample versus the experimental sample. In this case you can see that the green is the controls, the red is the experimental. And we put that into the wells and we'll hybridize which means that we'll put half, so the sequence that's in the well is only a half a DNA sequence, it's only one half of the backbone and then we'll put the other half from the sample and if they bind together to form the double stranded uh, double or the double helix that we see it's going to then glow that color and so every dot you see here that's green is where the control sample is, is present every dot you see where it's red is where the uh, experimental sample is glowing and anything that's yellow is where they're both present so you can see how that works. This allows us to see the differences between DNA sequences. So for instance, if we are looking for the genes that maybe cause breast cancer, we can go through this process and anywhere where if the experimental samples were the cancer patients and the green samples were non-cancer patients, anywhere where there's a red is a sequence that we should be investigating because that means that that is a gene that is being either upregulated or shown um, a mutated sequence within the cancer patient population that might be a good target for us. So this is at the end of topic one. Please review your objectives and let me know if you have any questions about it. And when you're ready, go on to topic two, which is all about chromosomes.